excited about preaching God's word to you today, excited to preach and, and come into your homes or your living rooms or your cars or wherever you are, or maybe you shouldn't be in a car, you shouldn't be traveling around uh, right now, but wherever you are, we believe God's word and one word from God can change your life forever. And that's what we're going to do right now. Now, uh, a few uh, weeks ago, I was away traveling when we were allowed to travel, and uh, my, uh, my wife was home alone, and there was a gentleman who approached the house who was wearing a ski mask, and he was asking to come in the house. And so my wife was obviously a little bit freaked out. I wasn't there. And unfortunately, our dog has a, a, a big bark, but he's not going to bite anybody. He's going to lick you. So the only thing she thought of was to call Mighty Xavier. Now, uh, if you know anything about Xavier, he, he, he's maybe not mighty in stature, but he's mighty in heart. Xavier, our youth director. So Xavier, in a moment, I mean, he dropped everything. He ran over to our house and he had a knife with him. Yes, a butter knife. Ready, ready to defend my honor while I was away. And uh, I was just laughing and it kind of made me think of what I wanted to talk about today. Uh, because here's the deal. Every one of us needs people in our life that are ready to fight for us. Re ready to go back to back with us when we're facing fears, when we're facing stress, when we're facing struggle. And I'm grateful that in my life I have someone like Xavier. But the question today is, in your life, who do you have? And I know that we are distanced today in many ways. We're distanced physically, but that does not mean we have to be distanced from our souls, from our human connection. And while the internet has many challenges and difficulties and confusions, I'm grateful today that we have the internet at our disposal, that we have our cell phones. And, and I heard somebody say this uh, the other day that, uh, oh, it's, uh, if this is the end of the world, the devil sucks. <laughs> because while we're quarantined and while we're hanging out at home, and I know a lot of people are struggling and suffering, and I don't want to make light of that, but at the end of the day, you and I have Netflix, and we've got Hulu, and we've got the internet, and we've got the ability to communicate, and uh, we got to count our blessings in the midst of being disconnected. But the point I'm making is, is even while we're disconnected, I still believe we can be connected soul to soul. And that's what I want to preach about today. I want to title my message for the next few moments, soul to soul, soul to soul. And I'd say that the role of the individual in the mission of God necessitates that we see our life in Christ as something inseparably connected to the life of the church and its people. So in other words, you and I have a responsibility to not isolate, but to stay connected to one another. Especially, and if, particularly if you call yourself a Christian, you have a responsibility to stay available to serve and to love those in your Christian community and even those outside your Christian community. And if you're watching this today and you're not a Christian, but this season of your life has implored feelings of searching for faith, I want you to know the Christian faith is all about being together. It's all about unity. It's all about loving one another in the midst of great trial, struggle, or persecution. And I want to read a popular passage of scripture today, and I'll give you a little context, but we'll use this as our framework, framework for our brief conversation. But I want to read Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Paul writes, carry one another's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the requirements of the law of Christ. That is the law of Christian love. Now, Paul is writing this in the context of the Galatian people actually being arrogant, a, a little bit pompous. They didn't fully understand grace and mercy. They understood deed. They, they understood action. Uh, they understood the idea that they were accepted because of what they did, but not necessarily because of what Christ had done. 
In other words, there was a legalism that was rampant in this group of people. So he's writing this, you guys are too focused on the law, on measuring up. You guys are too focused on doing your good deeds and thinking that those good deeds are going to get you accepted when it was already about a good deed that was done for you by way of Christ that you can't measure up, but he did it for you. And no longer are we trying or striving, we're seeking him and then he's changing our behavior from the inside out. And so Paul writes this because he's going, guys, you're making other people feel bad for their struggle instead of carrying their burdens in their struggle. I love what one theologian said, and I think this is really powerful, that nothing reveals the wickedness of legalism better than the way the legalists treat those who have sinned. I mean, that's convicting. Because what that illuminates is pride, which is the root. It's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the ground piece of all of our sin. When we say, I'm most important, I've got to take care of me, uh, my way or the highway, and because you have a struggle and you're not spiritual as me or you're not where I am today, I'm going to look up at you and I'm going to throw you out. But what Paul is saying is that's not the Christian way. That God offers grace upon grace, mercy upon mercy, and he, even in the sin of those who are struggling, sees hope and potential and passion. If you think about Jesus standing with the woman caught in the act of adultery, and you see all of the people standing around with stones ready to kill her, what does he do? He doesn't side with those who had no sin. He bends down with the woman who does. Jesus is illuminating what this is all about. It's about mercy. It's about grace. It's about one another. And he says, anyone who has no sin, well, then you cast the first stone. And of course, they begin to drop their stones. And he says, okay, woman, now let's do this together. Go and sin no more. So it's not that we suggest that there are no boundaries for Christian living and there's not a requirement in the sense of righteousness and holiness. It's just that we receive his mercy and grace. And from that, we make better decisions. And so if you have a posture of throwing people out just because of where they're at or because you've got to take care of you first, I would say that you're not carrying the burden of Christian love. You're actually carrying on a legacy of a law that was fulfilled by Jesus in and of himself. So with all of that said and with all of that in mind, thinking about being soul to soul, I want to remind you that legalist, legalistic people and bitter people People who isolate, particularly in trial and struggle, even though that's a natural tendency, those people aren't necessarily good at soul-to-soul healthy relationships. But relationships are the economy of the kingdom of God. God established you and I to love one another and care for one another and lean on one another. And what I'm telling you today, right now, wherever you're at, is we need each other today and now more than ever. So I want to ask you three questions today. Three questions I want you to consider. And here's the first one. Am I we and us or am I us versus them? That's what I want to consider today. Am I we and us or am I us versus them? What do I mean by that? In a state of panic, which many people are in, there's often blame. When you see panic, you seem blame. And I'm not saying in life that people don't need to be held accountable. They do. But I I maybe I'm suggesting that in a time of panic and and fear and concern, it may not be best to blame people for their struggle or their sin or what's going on. We might want to focus on unity instead. It's easy to be critical and divided when there is panic. It's easy for us to be divided politically. It's easy for us to be divided socially and emotionally. We're stuck in a house with people that we love, but seven days later, we're not sure we love them anymore. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. We get petty and frustrated and the thought of being secluded and isolated and quarantined for several days or even several weeks, it's good at first. I'm going to watch Netflix. I'm going to hang out. I'm going to chill. And then seven days later, I'm like, oh my gosh, please get out of my space. Move away from me. I need room. I mean, it's just natural. It's natural to get on each other's nerves. And what I'm saying is when there's panic, there's also, and usually division. When there's panic, there's also fear. And no doubt in this season, 
Fear of the unknown is on the rise. When is this going to end? When am I going to get back to work? When is the government going to send me a check? When is this going to end? When am I going to get sick? Some of us are like waiting. When am I going to get the virus? Fear of the unknown. And here's what happens to people. Here's what happens to humans when they fear. Two functions set in. You either fight or you flight. You either run into it and fight or you run away from it and you flee. Now, there's a difference between turning the other cheek and ignoring conflict or, or, or avoiding certain conflicts and isolating and fleeing and not dealing with what needs to be dealt with. And there's also people who fight the wrong way too. But what I'm encouraging us today is we need to fight with each other and for each other, not, uh, not against and we need not isolate in this season because here's what happens when people fear. And I want to read this to you. In, in our body, our breathing rate increases, our heart rate follows suit, peripheral blood vessels in the skin, they're pumped with blood and they're ready to react. So we're naturally on edge. Our muscles, including those at the base of each hair, it becomes tighter and that can even cause goosebumps. Even for hairier animals, it makes them seem larger and more formidable. So in some senses, fear can create an element of defense and a good reaction for us if it's managed the right way. Metabolic levels of glucose in the blood spike providing a ready store of energy if the need for action arises. That's why some people are ready to fight and they've got their weapons and they're ready for whatever's happening. But, but the point I'm making is, is our body and our mind, our emotions, it reacts in panic and fear. But I'd say to you that in a season like this, because most of us, what happens when we're fearful and when we're afraid and when we're reactive, what, what, what we do is we flee. We isolate. We say, I got to take care of me. I got to take care of minds. I got to make sure I'm okay. And I'm not saying in this season, we don't neglect ourselves. Self-care and self-health and health of your family is important, but I'm saying the law of Christian love is in the midst of the worst crises. We're still looking at one another and fighting for each other. Our natural tendency is to hold on to any security we can find and take care of number one and neglect our community. But I'm saying today, a community is always stronger together. Even if we're distanced physically, we can still be soul to soul. We have to learn the difference between fighting for and fighting against. And you've got to choose it. And today, right now, wherever you're at, and I don't care if you've not been a part of our church, maybe you're new to our online community, we're rolling out a new way for us to be soul to soul today, a new way for us to do church today. And I want to give you uh, three quick areas that you can be involved. So I don't want you to tune out. I want you to stay with me. And our hosts are going to jump in right now to drop you some links but we've got several opportunities for you to serve in this season and be soul to soul. You can be a chat host and you can support administratively. You, you can support from an outreach perspective. What we're about to launch next week, a needs bank where you're able to provide needs for those who have them or support or serve. We're partnered with other restaurants and organizations and uh, our, uh, the place that we rent in Port Richmond, they're supporting, uh, Catering by Mario's is supporting our efforts for a needs bank. And so we're gonna be meeting needs. You can be involved in serving today. We've got people standing by if you wanna do graphics or cut video or even lead a block group at some point if you're able. The point is, is it's not time for us to flee. It's time for us to fight. And just because, listen to me, just because we aren't gathering in person doesn't mean the church can't grow. But it's going to take all of us in this season. And speaking of that, I think it's got to be the biggest and most important season for block groups ever. And again, I don't care if you live in California or if you live in Japan or wherever you are, you can be a part of our block groups today. But especially if you call one of our physical locations home, you've got to be in a block group. This must be our greatest block group session ever. And so our hosts right now, they're dropping links if they haven't already for serving and also links for groups in Facebook and in our online platform. And we've got you, we've got to be involved together in this season in groups, everybody. And you don't even have to leave your house. They're all virtual. 
Finally, I want to encourage you, if you're a parent today, we are ramping up our ministry to students and kids, but I want to speak to our kids specifically for a moment, and then I'll move on and continue the message. If we are really we and us, not us first them, then we got to take care of our kids in this season. If you're not already a part of our Block Kids Facebook group and you're a parent, get involved. We are doing all kinds of stuff there, cooking and recipes and ideas, and we want to serve you well. We've, we've written cards and uh, we're staying connected to your kids. We're doing virtual play date meetups for your kids. So get involved, stay involved. We want to serve. We want to help. We're in this together. In a season like this, hear me. In a season like this, it's time to get most committed, not more isolated. It's time to get most committed, not more isolated. So, so, so question number one, is it we and us or, or is it us versus them? It can't be us versus them. That's not the law of Christian living. And secondly, I want to ask you, am I playing, paying close attention? In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, the scripture says, keep watch over yourselves and all of the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. Now, this passage is specifically to church leaders, but it's a great question. And I want to ask you this question. Are you paying attention to your health? How is your mind right now? That is the season we're in. How is your body right now? It's not a time to only eat junk food. It's not a time to only eat the carbs. How's my mind? How's my body? And how is my soul? We declared this the year of health in the beginning of the year. And I believe that word is so important, especially because our health is under attack. Are you paying attention to your mind, to your body, to your soul? Just because we're quarantined and stuck in a house does not mean that we've got to stop paying attention to our mind, body, and soul. And furthermore, it doesn't mean that we don't check on and keep accountable our brothers and sisters and ask how their mind, their body, and their soul is as well. To fulfill the law of Christ, we must bear with one another's burdens, which means loving our enemies, meeting needs, doing good to those who hurt us, laying our lives down for our friends. Given it will be given to you. We've got to sow if we have a need. And over the last several days, I've been on the phone, really last couple of weeks with several pastors, many pastor friends of mine. And, and I'll be honest with you. Pastors feel beat up right now. I mean, we feel like we just got thrown in the round, in, in a boxing ring with the Russian from Rocky Three. Is that Rocky Three? I think it is. Fact check me. And we know we're going to win, but we feel a little sore right now. I mean, it's been a lot. It's been a whirlwind. And I know many people feel that way as we wonder if what's going to happen to us and we're grieving and jobs. And I'm just giving you a pastor's perspective. I, I know my friends, many of pastors that I know, are going through it right now. We've been hit with a ton of bricks and we've been checking on each other a lot. And it's been good to see that sort of collaboration. But please understand that we as a church are desiring to connect with you. Pastors all over the nation want to check and care for their flock, the people that they love. And what we've done, if you haven't received it, we've written 800 postcards to our children. We are calling 1,500 adults We've sent out survey, surveys. We're asking if you feel cared for. And I think all of that is important and we're, we're doing the best we can. Also understand that as a team and as a staff and as pastors and church leaders, we're also trying to get our stuff together and make sure we are okay as well. And so I'm asking for grace from you, but here's what I'm also asking. Are you paying close attention to others? Because the thing is, is this is your church and these are your friends and these are your people just as much as they are mine. And so it can't be all on the church leaders and all on us to make sure everybody is okay. It's your church. It's your Christian journey. You also have to care for people as well. So I've written down some practical ways for us to stay connected during this time, to stay soul to soul. Here's some things. You should be present at home. Don't be on the phone the whole time. Don't be on social media the whole time. Don't watch movies the whole time. Play games. If you're allowed to take walks, do them. Be present at home. Call, FaceTime, text folks regularly, send messages and emails. 
Do a prayer call each day. That's what our staff is doing every day at 8.30. We're doing a prayer call to stay connected. Ask the Holy Spirit, wherever you are, to bring people to your mind and to your remembrance. And as he does throughout the day, don't hesitate. Send that text. Make that phone call. Do that FaceTime. People are panicked and fearful. They're struggling. You've got to do your part to be the church. Pray for people. Write cards. Drop them in your mailbox. Venmo or cash app somebody. Surprise them. Order somebody groceries or Uber Eats. Here's a great idea. I saw a pastor do this. Give toilet paper to your neighbors in a little gift bag and write a note that Jesus loves them and tell them about church online. There are a million ways to creatively connect to people. Love and community is not canceled. We're just not able to touch each other, but we can be soul to soul. And John writes in John 13, a new, the, the scriptures write, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Not just the pastors, not just the leaders. You love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. He's speaking to all of us. 1 John 15, 12, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. That's radical love. It's not just my responsibility to love our community. It's yours as well. So is it we and us or is it us versus them? Christian love say we've got to be unified. Secondly, we've got to be paying close attention to our health and to the health of others. We've got to take some steps in this time to care for one another. And finally, the last question I want to ask you as I close is am I building my life on or just around? Am I building my life on the kingdom, on the church? Because the first thing that I said today is that the role of the individual in the mission of God necessitates that we see our life in Christ as something inseparably connected to the life of the church and its people. So am I building my life on the kingdom of God, on God's people? Or am I just fitting it in? And what I think is going to happen as all of this ends, I think the rubber is going to meet the road and some people who have been playing games like, it's time to lean in. I'm going to build my life on. God is the only hope. He's the only firm foundation. He's the only thing that doesn't change. Minute by minute, hour by hour, the situation evolves, but he stays the same yesterday, today, and forever. His love, his mercy, his goodness, his faithfulness. And I remember my senior year of high school, I had an opportunity to go play football and have some scholarship opportunity. And, but I could sense the call of God on my life. And I had already committed to go play ball, but I just knew. I just knew. And so I had to go back to teachers and to coaches. And I had to tell them that God was leading me in another direction. Now, as an 18-year-old, and in a public school, they didn't fully understand that. But I knew my life was supposed to be built on, not around. And that's not everybody's decision, but it was what God was calling me to. And it made me think, as I close, of Matthew chapter 7. The scriptures say, So everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, Jesus saying, well, Like a wise man, a far-sighted, practical, and sensible man. Amen who built his house on the rock. And by the way, ladies, if you're looking for somebody, look for somebody like that. So everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man, a wise man, okay? Here's, here's why, because rain fell and the floods and the torrents came and the winds blew and slammed against the house, yet it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock, on, not around. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish, stupid man oof, who built his house on the sand. See, that's what happens. We, we build our house on the sand. God is a thought. He's a picture, but he's distant. He's an idea. It's time to stop living as if God is an idea and start living as if he is who he says he is. And the rain fell on the man who built it on the sand and torrents came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great and complete was its fall. You gotta build your life on, not around. I'm so glad I made that decision in high school when I did. 
And I want to give you an opportunity to make those decisions today. I want to give you four steps today as I close. Four quick steps and we're out of here. Number one, get in a group. Best thing you can do in this season, get in a group. Number two, serve with us. Don't just sit. And I know some of us are overwhelmed and when the opportunity presents itself and when it's the right moment, do it. But get in a group and serve with us. Number three, reach out to neighbors and community members. Reach out to them. Reach out to this community of people. It's number three. And number four, I want to encourage you, if you're still working and God is still providing, I want to encourage you, you should still be giving to your local church because your local church is stepping on the neck of the devil right now. And we are in covenant with God. And God's promises are sure. They are yes. And they are amen. And you don't have to fear. I'm telling you, I'm leaning in on God in this season. I'm grateful to give to see the work of God continue. But also I know that I'm in covenant with God. And he's going to see me through every step of the way. So guys, thank you. Thanks for joining us today. And I want to take a moment right now before we close And I want to offer you an invitation to join the kingdom of God. If you're far from God today, maybe at one point you had a relationship with him or you've never been in relationship with Jesus before. Today's your day. Now's the time. This is the moment. You used to know God, used to be in relationship and you want to recommit to him or you've never been in a relationship with God. This is the moment. I'm going to say a prayer. I want to invite you to join us. And if you say that prayer, If you're in those two groups, I want you to click that button below. That's what I want you to do. I want you to raise your hand below. So we're going to pray. And then if that's you, I want you to click that button. Come on, everyone, everywhere. If that's you, you're far from God, or you want to begin a journey from God, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the cross. Thank you for grace. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for loving me and dying for me and raising from the dead. Raise my life today. Be my Lord, be my leader, be my Savior. I give it all to you. You are mine and I am yours. And I commit now to living the law of Christ, not the law of man. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen to me. If you prayed that prayer, greatest decision you'll ever make, click that button below. And we cannot wait to be with you next week on Palm Sunday. God bless you.